That was four lectures, by the way. Like four hours of lectures, so it's not bad. <laughs> All right, click. Okay. Oh, great, I didn't write the objectives, I forgot. All right, extra oral exam. So uh, uh, there's, two, there's two objectives. There's the extra oral exam and intra oral exam. We as dentists have a tendency to focus on just the teeth, but I think she was focusing on the fact that it's really important for us to look at everything else um, much before then we get involved with the teeth part of it. Because that's like that for us is the interesting part, I get it, but um, it's really important for overall health of the person to look at everything else that's going on in their body before you even get to the teeth so that way you don't get distracted. Because yeah, you like you want to fix that caries, you want to fix the tooth, you want to make this better, you want to make this cute, but look at everything else. So I, I took an approach at it to kind of like make it easier for me to memorize is to kind of use the bottoms up approach. So like when you're checking out a guy, for you guys I guess, if you're checking out a girl or a guy, you start at their legs and you work your way up, right? And you kind of like get to their face eventually. So the same way if you're checking out a patient, You'd start at their feet and their legs. You can kind of see their physical status from that. You can see how they stand. You can look at their skin on the legs. Um, they might have nice skin. You'd be like, yes, that's hot. And then you move up eventually to their waist and hip. You can kind of see at that point if they're kind of overweight or they're kind of like obese or if they're really thin. Uh, so that's one of the things right there. You're considering their weight. You can get to their arms. You can see their build. You can see if they're in a good mental status. You can see their nails, see if they're clean, polished. Um, you can kind of tell a lot from just doing that. And then eventually you get to their neck, you can see any kind of swellings if they're big in the neck area. And then um, you can see any kind of swelling, especially in the midline or the lateral region. You can tell if it's like that kind of area. And we'll talk about specifically what this means later on, but this is how like I would take an approach, taking out a patient. I mean, you really, don't start like in their face because that's like the <laughs> most important way. Start at the bottom, yeah, start at the bottom and work your way up. And you can't forget anything, so just do it the same way. And then eventually you get to their face and look, it's a symmetrical face, asymmetrical face. Are you attracted to it, not attracted to it? Do you want to ask them out? You don't want to ask them out. You look at their skin. Do they have nice lips? Maybe you want to kiss them. I don't know. Just don't do it because that's probably a lawsuit. Uh, look at their head. See if they're balding hair. Look at the shape of their head. Is it normal? Do you want to date them? I don't know. Do you want to have kids like that? <laughs> Uh, anyway, so let's check them out. So emphasize, she emphasized three things extra orally that is really, really important for us. Uh, the skin. So she said there's a couple of things that are normal or benign, and there's a couple of things that, yeah, they tell you something is going on, and you should check it out. Okay? So the first thing she said was benign was the, the seborrheic kerat keratosis. This is when she showed the Morgan Freeman face. Um, and he had all the little spots in his face, the black spots. They kind of look like waxy, little stuck-on things, and they're they're very raised in growth. But they're not they're not they're not there's nothing wrong with them. They're just completely normal. So remember we talked about skin on the legs, skin on the arms. You can kind of see this on the face area. Um, so if you see these, there's nothing wrong with them. They're just they're part of it, and they're usually in like African American people, so. and you might even see them on white people too, white Caucasians, I guess I should say. Uh, the pre-malignant ones. Now these are bad. Not the worst, they're bad. Um, so there's solar or actinic keratos keratosis. Solar, anytime you hear solar, it means sun. And usually these are sun exposure related, so sun-related keratosis, which is basically your uh, rapid growth of your keratin layer and stuff like that. And so they become thick, scaly, crusty skin. And all the notes, um, if you want, are on the presentation. They're in the notes section, so just take a look at that. Uh, so that's solar keratosis. Uh, this one's a little more keratoacanthoma. I think it's pronounced, or acanthoma. Uh, this one's precancerous, usually uh, thick, scaly. Oh, sorry, this one's, no, sorry, that's right. This is low malignancy. So this one is usually precancerous, so sometimes it can, like, these are usually something that you will take care of. You'll look at them and be like, well, we should probably, like, look into it or track it and keep an eye on that because this could become worse very easily. So solar, sun damage, keratosis, uh, scaly, crusty appearance. Keratosis uh, asymptoma. This is low malignancy usually, um, and so sometimes it can like go away by itself, but sometimes it can become bad. So <laughs> uh, they usually originate from like the the hair follicle area. So you kind of see like this like hair follicle area becoming very uh, rapidly growing, and you will see this like really thick, crusty inside, but a really smooth, inflamed surface on the outside. So it kind of looks like a volcano. So almost like a volcano. So you'll take a look at that after. Uh, basal cell carcinoma, this is again basal cells of, this, of the epithelial layer uh, mitotically dividing really quickly. Not very dangerous because it doesn't usually metastasize because it's in the epithelial layer, not the connective tissue layer, which is okay. Uh, which is, well, it's not okay, but it's better than having in the connective tissue layer. It's slow growing um, and it usually looks like a nodule and very red patch sometimes. Worse, obviously, squamous uh, cell carcinoma. This is getting to the connective tissue now. 
It's uh, very easy to metastasize. It looks very different in a lot of different people. And melanoma is one of the most common skin cancers, and it has four defining, uh, four ways to define, or four ways to characterize it very easily. The ABCD method. You're talking about the asymmetry, the border being really, really uh, not very defined around the whole thing, the color, and then lastly the diameter being really big. So usually melanomas will start where like moles are, and then eventually like they'll kind of look like a mole at the beginning, and then they'll become really big or become really different colored, and you can kind of tell it's becoming a melanoma, and that's very serious. Can you explain why I don't really know why basal cell carcinoma may be worse than like I know squamous cell is different, but shouldn't like say why? Uh, basal cell is is going above into the epithelial layer, so you're not into going into the connective tissue layer. But the squamous cells are on the outside. Yeah, squamous cells means that you're penetrated past that epithelial border, so you can kind of get inside. Like, they're dividing downwards rather than going upwards. Oh, they're dividing going Yeah, they're going down into the connective tissue. basal cells, the low, I mean... Yeah, basal cells starting at the bottom, working their way up, like, rapidly growing upwards. So you get a kind of bubbly-looking appearance on the outside, versus squamous cells are kind of becoming ulcerated and going inside the connective tissue layer, which means that the cells are now migrating into the connective tissue, which means they can met metastasize pretty much basal anywhere. Cells are Basal cells of the epithelial layer going upwards. Like when they mitotically divide for basal well, cells, they move up, right? Am I having like a brain fart of what the squamous <laughs> cell is? No, it, it, squamous cells just described like the squamous cells. Yeah, the squamous side. Like, yeah. Yeah. Aren't there squamous cells on? They are. They're just dividing in a different, like, they're, like, they're, they're, they're both dividing. They're just dividing in a different, like, they're both in the same epithelial layer. Yeah, you're right. They're both epithelial in nature, yes. That's absolutely true. But, like, one of them has, like, a potential to go downwards into the connected tissue layer because they're ulcerating versus, like, the basal cells are usually staying in the epithelial. Yeah, exactly. So they're mitotically dividing upwards rather than going downwards. Yeah, exactly. um, and so now I have pictures. And I thought we could play a guessing game. <laughs> just, okay. So the first one, um, remember that volcano shape I was talking about? So that's a crusty, scaly inside, and the hair follicle usually is inside here, and then the inflamed surrounding layer. So if you saw somebody with this, you would say it's a, not a solar keratosis, it's a keratoacinthoma. Uh, so yeah, keratoacinthoma. Yeah, exactly. This one, crusty, scaly looking thing. Some exposure. So, do you see the difference between this one and this one? So they're kind of close. You can see the crusty inside, crusty the whole way around, inflamed out the outside. So the keratoacinthoma. This is a solar keratosis. So this is the solar. This is the first one. Okay. This one, you can see it's like kind of ulcerating and going inwards. This is your squamous cell, the carcinoma. This one's kind of bubbling outwards, basal cell carcinoma, and this is your. This looks like a melanoma, but it's not melanoma. This is just a sub. Uh, this is a benign one. So this is a subaroic uh, carrot. This one's hard to tell, but it looks like a mole, but it's not. It's just a uh, the Morgan Freeman disease. We'll just call that now. But that's it. So it's it's. I know it's hard at the beginning, but if you kind of get their appearance in your head, kind of get the keratoacinthoma has that crusty inside, the inflamed outside, the crusty scaly basal cell squamous. It just it kind of becomes easier, but you'll see a lot of variation in these. So. It's hard to tell. Next thing she focused on was the neck. So we focused on skin first. The neck, so only three things in the outer layer. Okay, so there's skin. We did that already. Neck. So you can have swollen lymph nodes. Now, they can have two different reasons they can be swollen. One could be that it's just inflammation. Um, so, 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 so like let's say you have an immune response to something. They're inflamed. That's fine. That's normal. Don't worry about it. On the other hand, it can be neoplastic, it can be cancerous, it could be something that you have to worry about. So you have to know what the difference between the two things are. And she threw a great table on there and I have it too. So just look at that. That's more important than everything else. She talked about lymph nodes. I don't know if she's going to go into details about testing which lymph nodes to feel, but I would know what the difference between inflammatory response versus neoplastic response of lymph nodes is. Swellings. So now there's can be congenital, con, congenital? Yeah. There can be congenital swellings and there can be swellings you have to actually worry about. Okay? So if you see swellings that are not one of these, then worry, <laughs> because they're usually either lymph node swellings or some sort of uh, cancerous swelling, um, tumor swellings, stuff like that. So congenital ones, we already know them from before. Remember in the lateral neck, we have the branchial cyst, and that's where the cleft basically closes, and if you have a cyst, then it becomes sometimes big 
and you can see a swelling there. Midline, we know the thyro uh, thyroid gland goes down, descends down. We have, we have the thy thyroglossal duct, as the that can cyst. And then we can also have a thyroid, which can become like really big because of iron deficiency, TSH, and that can lead to a goiter. So these are things that you might see, and we can diagnose that pretty easily. With goiter, I would kind of worry about that one a little bit. <laughs> And so this is what she threw on the, on, the, on the presentation about the inflammatory versus the neoplastic. So we can see inflammatory, you would actually have a painful, like when you like kind of palpate the lymph node, it would feel painful. Versus neoplastic, because the cells are dividing rapidly, you don't really have sensation down there because of all the factors that are being released. The nerves are kind of basically numbed at that point. So you don't feel pain. So it's kind of weird. You have a swelling, but you don't feel pain. That's usually more dangerous than feeling pain. Pain is good sometimes. Um, uh, concurrent, if you have infection, obviously that makes sense because you have lymph nodes that are swollen for an infection, you have infection. Uh, fever is normal with an infection versus like a neoplastic, so you won't have a fever. If you have weight loss on the other hand, you're looking at cancer because rapid growth would means rapid use, using of the nutrition that you have, so that means that you might see weight loss in a person. So, so you kind of see like they make sense, just take a look at it, it's important. Uh, tender, you would feel tenderness and inflammatory. They won't usually feel tender. Again, you don't feel the pain there because it's just a cancerous division. It's not inflammatory. Uh, rubbery, it will feel like that. Rock hard, neoplastic. If it's like super rock hard, that's probably just cells mitotically dividing uncontrollably. Okay? Size, bigger. Neoplastic are going to be bigger. Okay? Make sense? So far, so good? So that's, that's the second thing. So first, we focus on skin. Next, we, next we focus on swellings that can be congenital swellings or they can be lymph node swellings and there's two types of lymph node swellings we have to worry about, inflammatory or, in, uh, or neoplastic. Okay? So far so good. And the last thing she focused on extra orally was the lips because that's basically the entrance to your mouth and that's not that hard. So normal, what should you normally see in a lip? Uh, well, it's everything you can think of. Uh, you, you see nice dark pink lips, you can see a distinct interface. Sometimes you can have melanin pigmentation, that's fine. Some people have darker lips, not a big deal. Sebaceous glands, we already know this from previous classes. These are, these are really common on the buccal mucosa, on the labial mucosa, they're common on the lips. It's not a big deal. On the vermilion border, that's fine. Um, abnormal, on the other hand, you shouldn't see actinic chelitis, angular chelitis, herpes, labialis, and squamous cell carcinoma. So squamous cell carcinoma, anywhere you see, it's not normal. So don't. Anyway, let's talk about the actinic. Um, so actinic chelitis, how are you going to be able to tell? It's, um, it looks gray. So if I, usually your lips will look pink or kind of pigmented. This looks kind of gray. And then the border between the lips and the actual outside skin, there's not really a distinct border. It kind of just blends in. So it looks like a person doesn't really have lips because they, they're so gray and kind of blended in. So that's one of the things you would see. Um, angular colitis is the same as the actinic colitis, except it happens at the angles. So at the, at the commissures of the lips, you would see that more prominent there. Um, herpes labialis, you already know this one. It's known as cold sores, whatnot. It looks bubbly, nodules, and they can be very contagious at that stage. And lastly, squamous cell carcinoma. Again, it's rapid growth, darker in color, very different appearances. Okay, so first so good, we're done. Three things. So that was skin, neck, and lips. That was the only extra oral things you can know. So remember, go in that order. Start with the legs, look at their skin, look at their physical status, look at their waist, look at their hips, look at their weight, arms, uh, hands, nails, their face their neck, their lips, their face, the symmetry, their hair, their scalp, I don't know, whatever you can look at, and then finally get to like their, their lips and stuff, and now we're gonna go more intraorally, okay? Again, we're gonna do it in like an order that makes sense because that way you can repeat when we do this, okay? So first we're gonna focus on the labial mucosa, so the inside of the lips. So we just have the outside of the lips, let's talk about the inside of the lips. So what's normal? We should have minor salivary glands. What's not normal? For them to lose their duct and start making all the mucus, inside the connective tissue. When that happens, we call that a mucosal. Okay? And that forms a cyst-like structure. And that's what that is. Okay? We're done with labial mucosa. That was all that was there. Then the buccal mucosa. So we're going to the cheek part. So normal, we should have a para parotid papilla. Specifically, if you remember for anatomy, that's the one that comes out in front of the second maxillary molar. We should have, uh, we should have, <laughs> we can have linea alba. What is linea alba? Does anyone know? Linea Yeah. And how can you tell it's linea alba, not like lichen, or lichen platypus or something like that? Palpus? Planus. 
Yeah, it's a white line, and it's usually in line with your occlusal plane. So wherever you bite, usually it's in line with the teeth right there. And the best part is, it's not it's not dangerous, it's not anything. It's just because you keep chewing on that area, or you keep hitting it with force and friction, and it's just basically your body protecting against the forces you're putting on, and it's fine. Uh, leukoedema, it's basically um, kind of like, it looks like a bruise inside your cheek. So it's like a bluish appearing... It looks like everything's bruised on the cheek, but it's not really dangerous. All it is is basically the mucus is built up inside the, the epithelial layer, and it looks bluish through the skin. So it's not a big deal. Um, next thing you talk about sebaceous glands. We talked about sebaceous glands before. Again, they're, they're normal, especially in older people. Uh, and then melanin pigmentation. Just like the lips, you can have melanin pigmentation in your buccal uh, mucosa, and it's fine. Okay? Things that are not normal, fibroma. So anywhere you see fibromas are not normal, they're basically these huge swellings that come out and that's usually caused by either trauma, so you fall on your face and you like hit something and they kind of, you keep hitting it again and again and it builds up, or irritation, again, you keep chewing on it again and again and again and it just kind of builds up. And the next thing was lichen planus. Um, lichen uh, is this kind of, I guess, yeast-like infection that you can see. It's not, it's not in, in your mouth, it's not actually yeast. It just looks like it. It looks like a white uh, covering that happens. And that's um, usually an autoimmune disorder. It's your immune system attacking your own cells and causing dysplasia. Okay? So normal, parotid papilla, linea alba, leukoedema, sebaceous glands, and melanin pigmentation. What's not normal in buccal mucosa is usually fibromas, which are usually caused by irritation or trauma and lichen planus, which is, a, which is an autoimmune disease usually that's causing the cells of your epithelial to be destroyed. These are all in the notes, by the way, in the presentation, so you can take a look at that. And it's all online, so you can find it there. Uh, labial and buccal vestibule. So this is a space now in between the buccal, um, and like the gingiva, and then the labia and the, and the buccal area. So normally you would see smooth surface, uniform color. What's not normal, let's say you chew tobacco, you will see these these things called tobacco pouch keratosis and basically these are kind of like foldings and stuff and they look kind of white and scaly not good and then like an ulcer that can happen in that area too that's not normal but she only mentioned them very very little that's about it so that, that was it for the buccal vestibule so so far so good so we're done from the inside of the mouth we've done the labial mucosa we said that everything was normal there like including minor salivary glands what's not normal is mucoceles which is basically when a gland loses its duct and starts spitting all the mucus inside the epithelial layer and kind of makes like a cyst like structure that was called a mucosele in the bake uh, in the bake in the buccal uh, mucosa what was not normal was the fibroma and having the lichen planus and then the labial buccal vestibule what's not normal is the tobacco pouch and the linear ulcer Okay, so that's the three things we've done. So let's go in now to the hard palate and the soft palate. We're, start, we're trying to cover everything that's like around the mouth until we get to the tongue area, so let's avoid that for now. So the hard palate. Normally you would see the incisive papillae. So just like we saw parotid papillae on the, on the buccal mucosa, we would see incisive papillae because we have incisive glands. Uh, we have the rugae, which are normal. We have the, uh, sometimes there can be maxillary torus. So sometimes in people you'll see this bony growth on the maxilla. Even though it looks really abnormal, it's normal because a, a lot of people have it. And it's uh, usually an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern. So if their parents had it, sometimes they can have it. And it's just basically a compact bone that's kind of growing into their mouth cavity. And it's not usually a problem, like it's not usually abnormal. Abnormal can be nicotinic. Uh, stoma stomatitis, and <laughs> this is very similar. This is very similar to the denture stomatitis. So, what is stomatitis? <laughs> Basically, it's like um, you know the the, the 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 salivary glands that are found all along the hard palate. They can become inflamed. So, let's say you cause you smoke. So, you the nicotine inside this inside the smoke causes these things to react and they become inflamed. So, they kind of become big and open up. So, the salivary glands will kind of open up their papillaries and stuff, and it will look like the little spots on the top of your thing. So when you, and you smoke a lot, you get that. Also when you have like dentures and stuff, again, because you're like irritating that area, it becomes inflamed, okay? So what does stomatitis mean? Stomatitis is just um, inflamed uh, salivary glands, minor salivary glands. That's all there is to it, yeah. Um, thermal burn, also called a pizza burn. I don't even think I need to explain that. And then salivary gland tumor, anytime your salivary gland starts like dividing uncontrollably, you'll get a big tumor on top. And you can tell that's not the same as maxillary torus is when you press it, it feels like a, a more jelly-like versus a compact bone. Okay? So is that good so far? Okay. Soft palate. 
um, soft, smooth surface. So it's a, it's a little softer than the heart palette, obviously. Um, you can normally uh, get lymphoid tissue. You can see that there, and that that's fine because a lot of your uh, a lot of your tonsils and stuff and your lymphoid tissue surrounds that uh, soft palate area. So that's fine, normal to have because you have your lingual ton sorry you have your palatine tonsils, you have your uh, wall dyer tonsils uh, or your wall dyer ring basically going around the thing. And so lymphoid tissue is pretty common to see back there. You can have melanin pigmentation just like everywhere else. What's interesting is you sometimes have a bifid uvula, and that's fine. That's because it just uh, did not get to like join into one when it was dividing, or when it was coming together, sorry. Abnormal is papilloma, and papilloma is basically a, uh, a benign epithelial tumor that grows, um, I just copied this from Wikipedia, but it's a benign, she didn't really talk about it, so benign uh, epithelial tumor that grows exophytically in a nipple-like and often ring-like fronds. So on a picture, if you kind of um, want to see it, it's like this tiny spot that you have, and it's usually like growing out, so like a fibroma, except on the soft palate. Okay, so it's not usually caused by irritation and trauma, but it's more like a, a tumor that's happening up there. Okay? Is it like yeah, it's very much like an HPPI. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, it looks like that. Makes sense, because the papilloma. Human papilloma virus. Very clever. I like it. There you go. There's, I like you. I like starting with people. It's nice. And then we get to the tongue, which is like the big part. So there's three parts of the tongue. There's the dorsal part, the ventral part, and the lateral part. Okay, so dorsal part, normally you would see your taste buds and also the filiform papilla, which are not taste buds. But you would see filiform, fungiform, and circumphalate. Completely normal. Yeah, sometimes you get pigmented fungiform. Uh, fungiform are the ones that are found in the front area, through the mushroom top kind of things, and they can sometimes get pigmented, and they have little dark spots, and that's fine and normal, okay? Uh, you can sometimes have fissured tongue, so you'll see people with like little grooves between their tongue, and that, again, is fine and normal. It can be a problem if you don't have good oral hygiene, because obviously stuff can build up in it, but usually it's not, a, it's not abnormal. What is abnormal is when your filiform papillae get really long, and that can result in something called hairy tongue. And that's basically when you have like a really, really long filiform papillae and they look very hairy and they feel fuzzy to the touch. And what can happen is that food and, and smoking and all that stuff can create, um, get, get that hairy part of the tongue to become like different colors and it can look blue, green, black, and all these nasty colors. Uh, another abnormal thing is geographic tongue. Uh, sorry, uh, what well, I just mentioned, uh, aretha, arethematus, arethma, arethmatus, whatever. Okay, anytime you see areth, whatever, it just means red. So it's just a red spot. And so you can have uh, varying red spots. It looks like little countries on your tongue surrounded by a whiter area, and that's basically called geographic tongue. And they can move around. So these redness might go somewhere else and appear somewhere else. One of this type, uh, uh, one that very significantly appears in the middle of the tongue, we talked about it today too, is called the median rhomboid glossitis. That's basically one inflamed red area in the middle of the tongue and can sometimes have yeast infections on top of it. Okay, uh, So this is up here, it's the geographic tongue. So you can see the kind of red area surrounded by white. This is a hairy tongue. Okay. So first look good. So we've done the labial mucosa, we've done the buccal mucosa, we did the vestibule in between, we did the hard palate, we did the soft palate, we did the top of the tongue, so the side of the tongues. Okay, and then we finish up. So laterally, laterally we have the foliate papillae, so that's the ones being missed on top. So we have the foliate, the sour tasting ones on the side. Uh, we also have lingual tonsils. Okay, and sometimes we get a tonsillitis, and that's normal too because they have tonsils there. So it's fine. It's just swollen tonsils because we have an infection or something. Abnormal is traumatic ulcer. So on the side of the tongue, remember that's like the one of the most common places to have squamous cell carcinoma. Ulceration can happen there too, and that's not good. Uh, geographic tongue also plays a role in the lateral part. We already talked about that. And squamous cell carcinoma, again, that's one of the most common areas to get squamous cell carcinoma. That's why when you go to, to a dentist, they recommend that you actually get them to get gauze and pull your tongue out and check it laterally because that's one of the most common areas to kind of have these things happen. That's only things on the lateral you have to worry about. So far, so good? Okay. Lastly, the ventral thing, the uh, only thing she mentioned was normal was the lingual varicosities, which is basically just like um, bluish veins appearing at the bottom. And they're just very enlarged and very like blue looking, so sometimes it can freak people out, but it's completely normal. Okay. So we're done tongue. Lastly, the floor of the mouth. Um, lastly, did I miss anything? 
I have a question. Yeah, what's, what's the that? difference between um, between um, hairy tongue and coded tongue? Hmm. Sorry, I was just hairy yeah. versus coded. Coded. A geographic. The same thing. Code. The same thing. Coated tongue? Yeah, Co oh, coated. Yeah. Oh, I was confused. Ah. The conference, the nation said they were the same thing, but yeah. Hairy tongue versus coated tongue. Yeah, the conference, the nation like one. She said they were the same, but Dr. Shah said they were different. I don't remember Dr. Shah's without me. Yeah. I don't, I don't know what the difference between the two, that's for sure. Um, floor of the mouth. So normally at the floor of the mouth, we have the lingual frenum, which connects the floor of the mouth to the tongue. Sometimes that can be short, and that's called ankyloglossia, ankyloglossia, uh, ankyloglossitis, and then you can just cut that off. Uh, what else is uh, important is the, car, the caruncle or the openings of the warden duct. We know there's also other ducts opening up there from the sublingual gland, bartho bartholis, something like that, I think it is. And then sometimes you can get a mandibular, mandibular torus. No, it's not. I was just looking at that and I was like, wait a second. Code doesn't, I'm sorry, what was it? Code doesn't feel like what? Code doesn't, I don't think it feels like the rug. My heart, she said it feels like a. Mm hmm. Like Code is just like basically stained. So Got it, okay, it's just a stained tongue, okay. Yep, um, sorry. Mandibular torus. Uh, anytime you see torus, there's also maxillary torus. Uh, they're the exact same thing. Uh, torus is basically like a growth inwards of, I think, um, compact bone. I'm not wrong. Let me just make sure I don't get it wrong. I mentioned torus here. Yeah, so it's compact bone, and, and usually it's a, yeah, so we saw the, we, yeah, we just did this. So the maxillary torus happened up here. We saw the big compact bone, completely normal. You can also have the same thing happen on the mandibular too. So you see them right there. Uh, what's abnormal is ranula, which is a fancier word for mucosil. We talked about mucosil before. What were they? Uh, Where do we talk uh, about them, first of all? Salivary glands. Nice. Yeah, so remember in the labial mucosa, the mucosils were basically when salivary glands lost their ducts to the actual outside. Instead of going to the outside, now all the mucus was stuck on the inside and just got basically in like a tissue just kind of getting filled with mucus and they couldn't, like they almost were like popping out of the skin or popping out of the mucus, mucosa. So it looks like a cyst. Uh, Sialoliths, sialol I guess I was calling them. But salivary stones. So you can get salivary stones, and uh, one of the stones can appear in the Wharton's duct, uh, which is a pretty long duct, so it can happen there. Uh, leukoplakia. These are basically white lesions that don't come off. So a very common in the floor, well, not very common, but abnormally common in, uh, in the floor of the mouth. And squamous cell carcinoma, again, that's one of the areas that's very prominent at. So not very different from everything else we've done. And lastly, er after all this is done, you'll look at their teeth, the occlusion, check gingiva, alveolar region, and check the TMJ. Okay? So let's just do a quick, um, is there something for it? Yeah, have a guide going to the exam. Make sure you repeat the steps in the same order every time. Focus on teeth last, even though that may be the first thing you want to do. Um, so, if we're to go back here, so remember, it's important. Look at look at everything else outside first. Look at their legs. Look at their waist. Look at their arms. Whatnot. Look at their neck, face symmetry, uh, head. Uh, she focused on three things on the outside very specifically. She said the skin is very important to look at, the neck is very important to look at, and she said the, uh, the lips itself, the outside of the lips, very important. Intraorally, she started from the labial, I started from the labial mucosa, I just organized it a little differently. Labial mucosa, buccal mucosa, vestibule in between, hard palate, soft palate, dorsal of the tongue, sides of the tongue, ventral of the tongue, and the floor of the mouth. After that, you're done. You just do the teeth. So just follow that. And one of the great ways to do it is since there's two of you, you can practice. Uh, why don't you just try doing no, an exam? You're not gonna get it in. <laughs> You're not gonna get it in. All right.